Welcome to JCT TV. This is Bible teaching for the 21st century. I'm really looking forward to the Beatitude today, which is blessed are the merciful. Mercy is a vast topic and I, I can only scratch the surface on this one, but I, what I have for you, I think uh, is gonna add a lot of value to your thinking and how you, how you see it. And hopefully by the time the show is done, you and I will both be renewed in our commitment to being merciful above all else. Remote and rural, these children and their families have no access to medical care. There is no clinic nearby. And when a mother is desperate to save her dying child, she will walk for many hours. Sometimes the child doesn't survive. So we go to them. These tables and chairs under the trees look like a gathering, not a medical clinic. But the doctors and nurses are transforming the lives of the children and their families. They provide primary medical care, classes on sanitation, medicines, and a better understanding of HIV and AIDS. Most of all, they bring hope as they diagnose, treat, and educate families. This clinic is a gift from donors that will transform their lives. You can become part of that transformation. Your your gift of $25 will provide health care for an entire family. $100 provides care for six families. Be a part of real change. Go to wowmission.ca slash save a child. So Jesus has sat down with his disciples up there on the top of the mountain. And I've told you early on several programs ago that it's not a mountain as we would think the Rockies, for instance, but it's a very high hill on the north end of the Sea of Galilee. Beautiful view from there. I, I've been there many, many times. I used to actually drive up the Mount of Beatitudes and down the Mount of Beatitudes every time I went up to southern Lebanon to broadcast from a radio station there once a week when I lived in Jerusalem. I know it very well. And on the way back from Lebanon, I would often stop there around 5, 5.30 in the afternoon as the sun was on a very steep angle and the Sea of Galilee would be a brilliant blue, and the grass growing around the volcanic rocks on the hillside going down to the lake would be a brilliant green. And then the, uh, the, the citrus orchard, orchard, which grows up the side from Capernaum up, up the Mount of Beatitudes, would be brilliant in its color and birds singing, and I just a gorgeous spot. Anyway, Jesus is up there teaching his disciples this, um, these marvelous truths that we now know as the Sermon on the Mount. And we've gone through uh, the poor in spirit, uh, those who mourn, the meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And I have been demonstrating to you, hopefully with some effect, how there is a kind of a process going on here, one leading to the other. Well, certainly merciful springs out of um, the the righteousness that the disciple of Christ should hunger and thirst for. Um, because he himself has been a recipient of mercy. And so being merciful seems to be a no-brainer for those who have been shown mercy. And yet, human nature being what it is, we sometimes have to be reminded. Now Jesus, as you know, had brothers and sisters, half-brothers and sisters. And uh, the most famous of them all was James. As far as we know, James did not believe in Jesus until Jesus made a post-resurrection appearance to him. Uh, Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 15. A special appearance just to James. James obviously became a believer because he became the leader of the early church in Jerusalem and was highly regarded and highly, highly respected as a Jew of the Jews. Uh, tradition tells us he used to go up to the temple every day on his knees, about 200 steps, stone steps. Uh, he lived a very upright life. And he wrote one of the books in the New Testament called the book of James. It's interesting, he, as an Orthodox Jew, is so focused on the demonstration of faith by works that Martin Luther, the father of the Reformation, 
wanted to throw the book of James out of the canon of Scripture. He called it an epistle of straw. Why? Because Luther was focused on Paul's teaching about being justified by faith. As if it were either or. Um, clearly it's both and. Both faith and works. Uh, the two work together like a horse and carriage. But that's for another discussion. But in the context of his writing, in chapter 2, verse 13, James says, Judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over, ju over, ju over judgment or over justice. Now here you have it. Um, let's see, I guess it's the next slide here. Uh, let's get it. Uh, no. Uh, blessed are the people, blah, 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 blessed are the merciful. Yeah, but there it is, verse 7. <laughs> blessed are the merciful. In the Hebrew, the word for merciful is um, chesed. Now there is this, word, uh, this letter in the Hebrew uh, alphabet where it, you have to sound like you're clearing your throat to say it. I, I sometimes say this so, it's such a sandy desert atmosphere there, you're always clearing the sand out of your throat anyway, but chesed, chesed. Essentially, even though it's translated mercy, the nuance in the Hebrew means to walk in the other person's shoes. And it is true that when you walk in the other person's shoes, you tend to have a much more understanding and merciful perspective than you would have as a mere outsider looking in. In fact, the uh, the French have a proverb which is very profound. To know all is to forgive all. Mm, isn't that interesting? To know all is to forgive all. If you are aware of all of the factors that contributed to that person's decision, to that person's behavior, uh, nine times out of ten, you're going to show mercy. I, I'll give you an example. I was um, at my wife's parents' little cottage on Lake Ontario years ago. We'd come back just for a few weeks from Jerusalem where we were living and uh, we're visiting family and friends and Kathy's mom and dad were at this little cottage. And um, I had ridden there on my motorcycle and I had parked outside the cottage. Anyway, my kids were just little and I suddenly heard another kid in a very loud voice verbally abusing them in the worst language. I mean, it was, it was enough to make your hair stand on end. No kid, I, where did a kid get a vocabulary like this? And as a father, you know, my first instinct was to get out there and protect my children from this verbal abuse. And so I ran out there ready to, you know, give this kid, uh, you know, a very strict uh, piece of my mind. But I, I stopped in my, in my rush to judgment. Because even as he turned and looked at me, I saw that he was a pathetic little creature. He was here at this kid's camp, but he was very poorly dressed. He wasn't washed. His hair wasn't combed. And right away I could tell he was an abused child himself. And often, you know, the abused child will just simply uh, parrot the abuse that he suffers in his home, in terms of language especially. And I literally was speechless, like I just stopped myself. And I quietly said, you know, I'd really prefer you not speak to my kids that way. And he kind of said, y y y y yes sir. And as he did so, he looked past me and I realized he was looking at my motorcycle. I said, hey, you like my bike? Yeah. I said, come on over. Want to sit on it? So he came over and he sat on my bike and we talked. It didn't take me long to realize that this was a pathetic little creature who'd known nothing but abuse all his life. I instantly, instantly forgave him his abuse of my own boys. Instantly, without um, any hesitation. To know all is to forgive all. Mercy, technically understood, means pity plus loving action. 
and I, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm using my own experience here only as a, as a little example. I pitied the boy, and my loving action was, come over to my bike and sit on it. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about you. You know, I, I, I've often said as a pastor uh, to people willing to hear me who have been in some kind of a conflict in the church body, uh, let's sit down like mature adults here and let's try to see the other guy's perspective on this, okay? Without being defensive and without bristling and keeping quiet until it's our turn to talk. I've seen it again and again as one party expresses their perspective, the eyes of the other widening with enlightenment and vice versa. To know all is to forgive all. Mercy is pity plus loving action. And you know, the difficulty that many of us face when we're being shown mercy is our pride, right? We don't want to appear to be in a position where someone should pity us or forgive us or show us kindness. We're too proud for that. Pride flees in the face of mercy received. It must, ultimately. Those who've received mercy make few, if any, judgments on others. And I, again, as a pastor, I've seen this in, in my churches. The, the people who have been forgiven much, the people who have been the recipients of merciful action are the first to show mercy to others. One of the churches I pastored uh, through an interesting combination of events, I ended up with a lot of people from the street, a lot of ex-cons, prostitutes, drunks, drug addicts, all of them who had just recently come to Christ and were you know, on a long, long journey of, uh, of healing. But they already had the light in their eye that came from having received the love of Christ. I've never met a more compassionate, forgiving group of people in my life. When you've been shown mercy, you show mercy. If I am forgiven, I will forgive. Now, in Jesus' time, the Romans despised pity. They saw it as weak. Militaristic culture. The Stoics, the philosophers of the day, they dissed compassion. They saw it also as weakness. And unfortunately, the Pharisees were harsh sometimes in their self-righteousness. Um, they saw suffering as a kind of a deserved punishment for sin. If you hadn't been so unrighteous, you wouldn't be suffering the way you're suffering. You know, the quid pro quo, the one plus one equals two approach to uh, behavior and, um, and health. When I was um, in high school, I used to love Shakespeare. In fact, English literature and English composition were my two favorite topics. Um, I wasn't so good in math, not very good in history, but I sure, I sure embraced English lit and composition. And I learned a lot of um, Shakespeare, but the very first Shakespeare play that I studied as a student was in grade nine, and maybe some of you have studied it too, called The Merchant of Venice. And you may re remember these words. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as a gentle rain from heaven. Upon the place beneath it is twice blessed. It blesses him that gives and him that takes. Tis mightiest in the mightiest. It becomes the throned monarch better than his crown. Powerful words. Mercy blesses the one who receives it, but also blesses the one who gives it. And if ever you have shown mercy to someone, you know what a powerful thing it is. Even though 
whatever the conflict might have been or whatever the issue might have been is still in the process of being resolved. You see light at the end of the tunnel, you have hope for its resolution, and you intend to see it through because you have started the process by showing mercy. James makes the point, and I want to read it again, judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. I'm sorry, judgment without mercy, yes, will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. It was um, Jesus more than anyone who modeled this marvelous quality. When on the cross, after he had been crucified, and he was still living, just before he died, he cries out in a loud voice, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. In other words, I plead their case because they're acting in ignorance, and how can we hold it against them if indeed this is so. I don't know if you and I could be so merciful. I'm wondering if it was maybe even harder for Jesus' mother and some of his closest associates to be as forgiving, to be as merciful as he was. Often it hurts the one who watches more than the one who actually is undergoing the death. But ultimately, friends, Jesus modeled mercy. He showed us in his own life the value it had from his perspective as son of God. And I'm sure that it's true that when you show mercy, mercy will come back to you. And once you have experienced mercy, you'll be forever merciful. You'll always remember that time when it came your way. And so, Getting back to that tax collector that I referred to the last few shows, groveling on the face, on his face in the ground, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He's fully aware of his sin. He's been collecting taxes from the occupying Roman government, from his own Jewish people. He's been adding a surcharge to the tax for his own benefit. And his own people have to give him the surcharge because if they don't give him that, he can have them thrown into debtor's prison. So he's got power over them. He's rich because of them. And they hate him. And he's a human being. He has a conscience. He knows he needs mercy. He cries loudly for mercy. And he receives it. work of the Word of God is stunningly remarkable. We must understand that God has placed His life codes of salvation and healing in the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Jim Canelon is focused on the messages that God has communicated through the Bible to you. If you have heard the divine mind speak to you through this program, then God has worked in an amazing way to reveal His Word. Remember that this program has cost and we've been faithful to bring God's Word to you. If you desire to give an offering in any amount, we would appreciate it. Write to us at Jim Cantillon Today, P.O. Box 989, Burlington, Ontario, L7R 3Y7. Or you can call us at 519-940-8338. Some of us have more experience with mercy than others. Uh, 
I'm thinking of a few situations, you know, as a, a pastor again, where people in my congregation were guilty of, in one case I'm thinking of a, an actual crime that he committed and uh, had to go through due process, had to face the criminal court and um, suffer the prosecution and the um, harsh comment, comments of some of the witnesses. And some of his family members were there and they had to undergo it too. And then uh, it was his turn to address the court, which he did with genuine regret and tears even. And I don't know how and why it happened, but the victim and the victim's family instructed their lawyer at that late po point to withdraw the charges. I don't know what it was about the process, but they decided to forgive this guy and to show him mercy. Now, there was still a legal process that had to be satisfied. So th there was still some, some debt to society that he had to pay, but the point is, it was far less than would have been required otherwise. You know, sometimes you'll hear juries or judges even comment on cases that have come before them, and they'll refer to the offender as having shown no remorse. Remorse is a powerful thing. And sometimes remorse is the thing that catalyzes mercy. You know, it's not, it's not that we're endorsing the action of the person, but it, sometimes in the process of the uncovering of the crime or the offense, like that French proverb I quoted earlier, suddenly we know all. And when you know all, you tend to want to forgive all. You, you, you see standing before you someone who in many ways has been bent by life, um, forever imprinted with hatred, abuse, disdain, uh, horrible words, physical uh, punishments, uh, sexual abuse. You know, it, sometimes it goes on and on and on. And, and, and there they are, you know, in their bent, distorted, unloved, unwanted condition, lashing out. And you might ask, honestly, well, why wouldn't they lash out? If they have any spirit left in them, why wouldn't they lash out? Why wouldn't they be angry? Why wouldn't they be bitter? And sometimes in our, you know, and we have this deep human need for justice, sometimes in our pursuit of justice, we make justice of greater value than the value of the person we wish to punish. Now, sometimes, you know, it has to happen. It has to happen and it happens. But this person who is the offender is someone who's been created in the image of God. This person is someone's baby. This person grew up as a little child, had no recourse when it was being victimized as a toddler, uh, had no power being shunted from foster home to foster home, had no one to defend them when they were out on the street at age 14, no one to protect them from the predators who swooped in, either as white slavers or as pimps or as uh, gang leaders and, and influence them even greater into the darkness of their lives. And out of their darkness and their hurt, they act. Again and again, you read stories about people who forgive their husband's murderer or their child's rapist. And you look at that and you say, how can they do it? Well, only one way can they do it. Mercy trumps judgment. 
somehow, some way, in their heart of hearts and in their thinking, they've understood there's more to this picture than meets the eye. And as deep as my personal hurt may be, there's something deeper still here. And it has to do with the value of a man, of a woman, however distorted, however crushed down by sinful behavior. They are redeemable. And often that merciful act is the first step in that person's redemption. The next time you want to crush somebody, think about this. By showing mercy, you may be the one who begins them on the path to newness of life. It's a powerful thought, something to take seriously. The world is a busy place. It's a big place, but it's never too busy or big for God's call. There are billions of people on planet Earth who need the power of God in their daily lives and situations. To help you discover the realities of praying and seeking God for the world in these last days, get this book by Brian Stiller. It's called An Insider's Guide to Praying for the World. 52 weeks a year, Brian Stiller presents another nation in need and to seek the Lord for help, divine intervention, and healing. A great resource for anyone who's thinking about praying and about the world with inspiring faith stories and on-the-ground insight. This will help you understand the big picture. Please send a donation of $20 or more to receive your gift. Send to Jim Catalan today. P.O. Box 989, Burlington, Ontario, L7R3Y7. Or you can call us at 519-940-8338. Now friends, it's not rocket science. I'm coming your way by television. I bought airtime. We have production time, all kinds of things behind the scenes, and all of it is money. Without finances, a show like this just doesn't exist, doesn't come your way. I'm very low key, as you know, on fundraising, but the fact of the matter is that we always need your support. I want you to think about that and uh, pray about it, take it seriously. Our coordinates are shown you throughout the show. Uh, do something for us, will you? Thanks for watching, see you next time. Contact us, Jim Catalan today, P.O. Box 989, Burlington, Ontario, L7R 3Y7. If you're sending a check, make it payable to Jim Catalan today. Or visit us online at jimcatalantoday.com and click support.